All right, so I think we've given two or three minutes extra time to anyone who might be finding their way in, but it's best to begin perhaps. So uh, before we start, um, I want to say that I hope that we all have, you have a, an opportunity to ask questions uh, after my session. We're lucky that there's lunch after us, so we wouldn't be bothered in the same way the way I bothered these guys before us. Um, and I do have a microphone that I intend to pass around when we go into the question period, so that uh, you guys can all take your turn and, and just ask away. But the main point is that it's not really the, the answers that I'm trying to supply here for you today. Uh, but the questions. One of my favorite proverbs is a Chinese proverb and it goes like this. Seek not to know the answers but to understand the questions. And so, when we are confronted with an issue, one of the best things that we can start with is ask ourselves, what is the question that I should be asking? Because the type and quality of the question we begin with will ultimately determine, hi Darren, the type and quality of the answer we're going to get. And so today I will speak to you about the importance of asking questions. There are many questions that I will bring to your attention today, but perhaps the most important one that we will have to face, both as a, civil, both as a civilization and as individuals, is one of the oldest questions that has been around for thousands of years and we still have failed to provide an answer that satisfies at least the majority of us. And the question is, what is human? And so this presentation will not be about podcasting. Last year my presentation was about the 15 most fundamental tips that I could give you um, for starting and eventually becoming a successful podcaster. I shared how I passed over half a million views and got for 10 weeks in NASA at their bill, uh, NASA's Ames campus in Mountain View in California, and how I got to meet amazing people in person such as Ray Kurzweil, Peter Diamandis, astronaut Dan Barry, the people who send up the Mars rovers, and I got to visit amazing cutting-edge technological companies such as Google, Facebook, and Tesla, among many, many others. This year, I could have told you how my Singularity one-on-one -on -one podcast passed one million downloads. But the principles that I use and I continue to use to this day are the same. So going from half a million in three years and then doubling in 12 months to one million required nothing more than some momentum that I have gathered before and the application of the very same fundamentals. So let me say this again, this presentation will not be about podcasting. If you do want to find my tips and hear my personal podcasting story, you can go to singularityweblog.com and simply search for PodCamp Toronto. Then you will find the video, the audio and the text of last year's presentation. It's all there. Also, as you can see, my friend Josh from joshgloverphotography.com is recording today's session. So you don't need to take any notes, but just sit down and relax. Give me a week or two, and I promise I would have the video, the audio, and the full text with hyperlinks online, so that you can go and use it as a reference anytime you'd like. Finally, feel free to also come up with questions, because I will leave time, or I hope I will leave time for a brief Q&A in the end. Because you see, I believe that asking good questions is actually one of the most important and most fundamental skills that any intelligent being can acquire. And so while I did say that this will not be about podcasting, let me give you a couple of tips on the questions you should be asking when reading session descriptions at PodCamp Toronto. And I promise that will get me in a whole lot of trouble in just a second. So question one that you should be asking. How qualified is the person holding the session? You see, PodCamp Toronto is a fantastic open unconference. 
This is both a good and a bad thing. It is good because given its low barrier to entry, anyone can take the stand and hold a session. So I don't care who you are, what you do, or what your topic is, you are given an amazing opportunity to contribute to the public discourse on a topic of your choice. The bad thing is though, that again, given its low barrier to entry, anyone can hold a session. And thus, in the past years, the quality of those sessions has varied widely, from amazingly mind-blowing professional sessions to dismal, like absolutely horrible, as I'm sure there are a few of them running right now. <laughs> so this year, we had a new social media voting system implemented. And while it's not perfect, it was a great step forward to provide what's called social proof, authority. And so I expect that this will be actually the very best PodCamp Toronto yet. Still, it helps to ask yourself again, how qualified is the person holding the session? So my tip is this. If you have someone who will be talking about blogging, go and check out their blog. So from the get-go, unless your name is Seth Godin, and you see a blog hosted on a wholesale domain platform such as Blogger, TypePad, or WordPress.com, then that person likely has no idea about blogging. Other signs confirming that conclusions include, but are not limited to, low or no social sharing, low or no comments, lack of unique branding and design. Question number two, what is the metrics and how accurate it is in measuring their expertise. If the person is talking about YouTube and or video production, go check out their channel and look at their videos. If you see only low quality videos, no traffic, no comments and so on, I would recommend you're better off skipping that session. If the person claims to be a social media guru as a few of my colleagues do, Go look at their social media account on their PodCamp Toronto session. If there is no or only one their own tweet, most likely they're not social media experts. So don't bother going. Last year, someone was giving tips about blogging and they said that they had 30,000 hits for the previous past years. My tip here is to be skeptical, ask questions and dig deeper. So let's take this example. First of all, what is a hit? In most cases, a hit is either a page view or a visit. So I go load up my own blog on my own computer and this will give me one hit. If you click the refresh button, this will give me usually two hits and so on. Thus, just one among several better ways to estimate traffic will be, for example, how many unique visitors per month your blog gets rather than mere hits. This way you get a more accurate estimate of the audience size and the blogger's authority. So let's do the math together. With the example I just gave, with the person who was boasting they had 30,000 hits in five years. 30,000 divided by five years, each year has 365 days, would give you roughly less than 17, quote, hits per day. I already explained what a hit is, so you would see, I hope, that it's not a big deal that one can get those 17 hits per day just with oneself and a couple of friends. So again, if I were you, I would claim, don't waste your time learning from such quote, popular bloggers. And so to recap, today's tip for, today's tip for podcasting as well as most other things in life is be skeptical, ask questions, measure, and dig deeper. Okay, let's move on to the main question here today. Peering into our future's black hole, artificial intelligence, transhumanism, and the end of humanity. In my session description, I promise to share my answers to five fundamental questions. So let's go. Number one, what are the most Im important technological trends today? Since we can spend the whole day discussing just this topic, and we only have 45 minutes, and I'm hoping to get to questions two, three, and four, and five, I would start by giving you what I believe is by far the very best, the very most important uh, trend. 
and that's called exponential growth. This is also the easiest trend and the hardest at the same time. It is easy because unless you have been living in a cave somewhere for the last 50 years, you already know that the world is changing faster than ever before. Not only that, but the change that we can clearly see ourselves, I believe, is speeding up and accelerating in its own right. I believe this is more or less obvious and easy to see for everyone here. But exponential growth is very hard to grasp because our brains have evolved to make linear rather than exponential projections. And so, to help us grasp it better, let me use an ancient Indian chess legend as an example. The legend calls that the tradition of serving pai pao sam, which is, I'm told, rice pudding, which is being served in Hindu temples, originates after a game of chess between an ancient Indian king and Lord Krishna himself. So the king was a big chess enthusiast and had the habit of challenging wise visitors to a game of chess. One day a traveling guru was, challen was challenged by the king and to motivate him, the king promised him any reward that the sage could ask for if the king gets defeated. Now, the guru asked for a single grain of rice in the following manner. One grain of rice placed into the first, on the first square of the chessboard and then doubled every square afterwards. So, one, two, four, and so on. And the king accepted. They played the game and the king, of course, lost. So, having lost the game, the king, being a man of his word, ordered a bag of rice to be brought to the chessboard. Then he started placing rice grains according to the arrangement. One rice grain on the first, two on the second, four on the third, eight on the next one, 16, 32, 64, 120, 128, 512, 1024, and so on. And quickly realized that he couldn't pay his debt. Because following the exponential growth of that rice payment, on the 20th square, the king would have had to put 1 million grains of rice. On the 40th square, the king would have had to put 1 billion grains of rice. And finally, on the 64th square, the king would have had to put 18 billion trillion grains of rice, which is equal to about 210 billion tons of rice and is allegedly sufficient to cover the whole territory of India with a meter thick layer of rice. At 10 grains of rice per square inch, the above amount requires rice fields covering twice the surface area of the earth, oceans included. So it was at this point that the Lord Krishna revealed himself, his true identity to the king, and told him that he doesn't have to pay his debt immediately but he can try to do so over time. And ever since that day, when you go to a Hindu temple, you bring rice to try and pay that debt that's been sitting there for thousands of years. Now, I hope you agree with me that this is an interesting and powerful story that helps us understand exponentials. But some of you may point out that it is a myth. It's a legend. It's not real. Well, let us look at the best known example of exponential growth from the world of technology today, and that's Moore's Law. Moore's Law is named after Gordon Moore, the co-founder and former chairman of the Intel Corporation. It was published in 1965 and simply put, it states that the number of transistors that can be placed on an integrated circuit for the same price will double every 18 to 24 months. And we already know that, right? We know that computers are obsolete the moment you buy them and that the next computer will be at least twice faster for the same price. But today, everything is a computer. Your phone, your tablet, your camera, your car, even your toothbrush. And so we all have come to expect that the next generation of almost any product we buy is at least twice better than the previous generation. Thus, in a universe going digital where everything becomes information, we're increasingly able to manipulate and mold that information. And as far as the digital universe is concerned, we are gods. We can do whatever we want, but we have to remember that what used to be material is now digital. Take books and music records. They used to be material objects, 
but now they have dematerialized and have gone digital. The thing is that this is only the beginning. Everything is becoming information today, including people, including you and me. Take biology. Biology used to be a ma analog. But with the decoding of the human genome, it is quickly going digital, and now we can decipher and even 3D print biological tissues, even organs by design. And this is only the very beginning, as I said. We are well on the way of designing life on the computer screen and then pressing the print button to bring it to life. And so, as Stuart Brand says, we have become gods and we might as well get used to it. We humans are biological creatures. We are made of atoms. So more powerful computers allow us to learn and manipulate smaller and smaller particles in even more precise ways. Thus, there will be a day when we can create new bodies and even new brains. But I will talk about that a little later. Other major fields benefiting immensely from exponential growth include, but are not limited to, robotics and artificial intelligence, genetic engineering and synthetic biology, nanotechnology and 3D printing. And so, all of the above has often been described by futurists such as Ray Kurzweil and Werner Vinge, who believe that exponential growth trends such as Moore's law will eventually lead to a phenomenon that they have called the technological singularity. So let me address the question, the second question. What is the technological singularity? The term singularity has many meanings. In simple language, it means the state of being singular, distinct, peculiar, uncommon, or unusual. In mathematics, it means a problem with undefined answer. For example, 5 divided by 0. In physics, a singularity is a black hole a place where the fabric of time and space is ruptured and the laws of the universe don't seem to hold true anymore. And so we borrow this metaphor from physics to represent the accelerating changes that we can observe today, right now, in technology. And thus, if I'm to put the technological singularity in just two words, I would say that it is intelligence explosion. But there are numerous schools of thoughts on the definition with subtle but important differences. So I already said it's intelligent explosion, but it's a lot more than that. So now that you've heard the short version, let me throw at you a bunch of quotes to make things more interesting. The first one comes from John von Neumann, who was instrumental in the development of the atomic bomb and then the hydrogen bomb. One of the smartest people of the 20th century, genius in a number of fields, he said, the ever-accelerating progress of technology gives the appearance of approaching some essential singularity in the history of the race beyond which human affairs as we know them could not continue. Here's the original definition by a colleague of John von Neumann's British mathematician I.J. Good. Let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man, however clever. Since the design of machines is one of these intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines. There would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of men would be left far behind. Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that men need ever make. Another quote coming from a now classic NASA paper by Werner Vinge. Within 30 years, we will have the technological means to create superhuman intelligence. He wrote that in 1993, and he still stands by his timeline today. Shortly after, the human era will be ended. I think it's fair to call this event a singularity. It's a point where our models must be discarded and a new reality rules. As we move closer and closer to this point, it will loom vaster and vaster over human affairs till the notion becomes a commonplace. Yet, when it finally happens, it may still be a great surprise and a greater unknown. A future period during which the pace of technological change will be so rapid, its impact so deep, that human life will be irreversibly transformed. 
Although neither utopian nor dystopian, nor dystopian, this epoch will transform the concepts that we rely on to give meaning to our lives, from our business models to the cycle of human life, including death itself. This is Ray Kurzweil's definition. Kevin Kelly, founder, co-founder of Wired magazine, said, Singularity is the point at which all the change in the past million years will be superseded by the change in the next five minutes. A blog reader of mine who sent me this uh, definition of his that I like very much. The technological singularity is when our creations surpass us in our understanding of them versus their understanding of us, rendering us obsolete in the process. So the questions that I would ask here, that I'm asking here are, what happens to us when we stop being the smartest entities on the planet? What happens when your toothbrush is smarter, not only than you and me, but it's smarter than all of us, all of humanity put together. And so while we're pondering this issue, let's move on to question number three. What is transhumanism? Transhumanism is both misunderstood and feared. Francis Fukuyama famously called it the most dangerous idea. Put simply, transhumanism is the belief that technology can allow us to improve, enhance, and overcome the limits of our biology. More specifically, transhumanists believe that by merging man and machine via biotech, molecular nanotech, and artificial intelligence, one day science will yield humans that have increased cognitive capabilities, are physically stronger, emotionally more stable, and have indefinite lifespans. This path, they say, will eventually lead to a post-human, intelligent, augmented beings, far superior to men, a near embodiment of God. Some of the main issues here are, can humanity continue to survive and prosper by embracing technology, or will technology eventually bring forth the end of the human race altogether? Will humanity get polarized into neo-Luddite technophobes and transhumanist technophiles? Does that mean that widespread global conflict may be impossible to avoid? Who will be the dominant species? And finally, the question that I start with, what is the essence of being human? What is human? So let's move on to the fourth question. Can science make us immortal? Let me ask you another one. What is death? The definition of death may not be so simple and obvious as you may think. For example, there's a bunch of European Union countries which have very different definitions of death. So it, apparently, the Swiss and the Italians are not dead at the same time in the same state, it seems. And so in a way, death is just another way of somebody, usually a doctor, saying, I can't do anything else for her. But what we can or can't do has changed over time. And thus, the definition of death has changed and is continuing to change as we speak. It used to be the case that death was declared when one stopped breathing on their own. But today we have respirators that can keep us alive even if we are unable to do that. It used to be the case that death was declared when one stopped having a pulse, that is perceivable heart rate. But today we routinely stop heart beating during surgery. Just yesterday uh, there was a live tweeted bypass surgery and they were taking pictures as they sh shut down the heartbeat of the patient. So, one of the latest ways of measuring and or defining death is actually, now the latest thing is measuring brain activity. And as our knowledge and technology improve, in time, this is also likely to change. And so, can science make us immortal? Let me start addressing this issue by saying that science has made substantial progress with respect to aging and life expectancy. A brief historical survey of longevity throughout the ages will read something like this. 
During the Cro-Magnon era, life expectancy was 18 years. So basically in biology, and we were very much tight with biology at that period of our evolution, it's all about procreation. As soon as you procreate, next generation, you're ready to die. And people didn't on average make it over 18 years of age. In ancient Egypt, average life expectancy was about 25 years. In ancient Greece, in the time of Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, average life expectancy was 28 years. In 1400 AD Europe, average life expectancy was 30 years. So from the cro era, let's say 30 or 50,000 years ago, until let's say 1400 AD Europe, 50,000 years, we've managed to double life expectancy from about 18 to about, let's say, 30, almost double. But then, in 1800 Europe and USA, life expectancy went to 37. In 1900 USA, average life expectancy was 48. And so, when around 1900, Social Security was introduced at 65 in the United States, one of the reasons was because introducing it wouldn't cost much money to the treasury. And why? The reason was simple. Most people never actually made it to 65. They were dead way before that. The problem is that today, though, we are victims of our own success because almost everybody makes it over 65 today. In 2002, the, in the United States, the average life expectancy was 78. A child born today, anywhere in the world, is expected to live over 90 years. And right now, every one year, our life expectancy improves by three months. So what happens is this. This year, let's say, my life expectancy is, let's say, for brevity's sake, 90 years. Next year, my life expectancy will be 90 years and three months. The following year, it will be 90 years and six months, etc., etc. And so that process itself is also accelerating. And there will be a point when every year as we age, we would be able to basically hold time, stop the biological clocks, and enhanced life expectancy by another year. This is what Dr. Aubrey de Grey calls longevity escape velocity. At that moment, we would start having indefinite lifespans. So let's go to question number five. I'm rushing a little bit here so that I hope that I have managed to stir your imagination and we can jump into the discussion. Why humanity is doomed to go the way of the dinosaurs? We're often told that humanity is the pinnacle of evolution, but it is not hard to see that we are a beta product. We have numerous problems and we are far from perfect. In fact, what has allowed us to survive and prosper is our intelligence, which has given birth to our technology. Strip away all of our technology and the vast majority of us will not survive. Moreover, evolution never stops. So there was a time when dinosaurs ruled the earth, but it is always bound to happen. Things change. And what previously was a niche organism, namely mammals, took over and flourished, flourished while dinosaurs went extinct. Well, evolution is also accelerating. It took perhaps 10 billion years to form, to form the galaxies in our planet. It took another couple billion years before we had the first simple single cell life forms. Then it took hundreds of millions of years to get plants and eventually dinosaurs. Hominoids have been around for perhaps something like six or seven million years. And then Homo sapiens have been around for about 50, maybe two, two, three hundred thousand years. And so everything is accelerating, but also everything is changing. And today, the fastest pay pace of evolution is one we can observe in technology. Thus, technology is supplanting biological evolution, and technological creatures are likely to replace biological ones, just like mammals replaced dinosaurs. In fact, 
This has already happened because, as I pointed before, our civilization is a technological one and it cannot survive without its technology. And so I hope that by now you would see that in the long run it is inevitable that humanity as we know it is doomed to go the way of the dinosaur. As we saw, evolution doesn't stop. And despite of what we are being told, we are not unique in any way. And just like all species before us, Homo sapiens will eventually go extinct. However, this does not have to be necessarily bad news. For as long as humanity evolves and there is continuity between what we are today and what we have to become to survive and prosper, there is hope. In fact, this, as Ray Kurzweil claims, is the very essence of what makes us human our ability to evolve and transcend. And so this is the choice. Evolve and transcend our biological limitations or go extinct. The choice is in turn derived from one of the most fundamental questions that we still have to confront and that I started with today. What is human? We have to find the answer to this question, both collectively as a civilization and personally as individuals. This session was not meant to provide definitive answers, but rather to set the stage and ask some questions in an attempt to generate discussion, to provoke thought and stir your imagination. My goal here was to spark a conversation about the impact of technology, exponential growth and artificial intelligence. My name is Nick or Nicola. My blog is singularityweblog.com and my blogging alias is Socrates, the man with the questions. Today I have tried to share with you my journey to discover who I am as a being, who we are as a species, and most of all, how does technology change the meaning of both the above questions and answers. And so now I would like to invite you to join me in this journey and start asking your own questions. Let us open the Q&A session. Yeah.